Welcome, fellow Stardust. Are you ready for a scare? I see you've come back for more. If you're new here, buckle up. And thank you all for joining me today. My name is DeRay, aka Rainbow Fright, lover of all things dark, creepy, and weird. Today's movie review will be on patron request, Bad Lieutenant. Deep down inside, don't you want them to pay for what they did to you? Don't you want this crime revenged? Thank you to my lovely patron, Terrence, for this request. This is a movie that I had been wanting to watch for quite some time, but never got around to it. I love crime movies, as you could probably guess from my love of true crime. And this one reminded me of some of my favorites that Harvey Keitel is also in, like Reservoir Dogs and Mean Streets. It also reminded me of Another Day in Paradise and Kids, both directed by one of my favorite directors. Larry Clark. Bad Lieutenant is raw and gritty and shot with an objective camera with the occasional POV shot. We follow Harvey's character, simply called Lieutenant, around documentary style as he goes about his day as a corrupt cop. The film was written by Zoe Lund, who was also in the film as Zoe the Junkie, who delivers the monologue at the end of the film. She actually co-wrote the script with director Abel Ferreira, although there have been claims that she wrote the entire story, but just received help with some of the dialogue as much of the movie was improvised or written on the spot. When the movie starts, it's difficult to watch. We have a man who talks horribly to his kids while on his way to drop them off at school. And before driving off campus, he does a few bumps of blow. He then hits up a crime scene where he checks the tits out of the deceased and steals coke from the scene that he gives to his dealer in order to make money for him. But despite how deplorable his actions might be, it's also hard to look away because Harvey Keitel is captivating in his every movement and every word spoken. Harvey's characters are typically supporting ones or a part of an ensemble, but in this movie, he shines front and center as the star. And we get all of him. Every last inch. While this is certainly a crime drama, religion sort of takes over as the main theme of the movie. This is a wonderful character study of a man whose past we know nothing about, but could probably make some educated guesses, and whose life seems to be unraveling right before our eyes. As we observe Lieutenant engage in his illegal activities, he's also caught up in the World Series between the LA Dodgers and New York Mets, which ends up essentially becoming the film's soundtrack. Good eyes, good eyes. Take it, take it. Instead of music, we're constantly hearing the sports announcer giving us the latest on the game happening that day. We only hear music about seven times throughout the whole film, and many times it's either short-lived or just background music on the TV or at the club. This silence throughout the movie, paired with the handheld camera work, forces the audience to feel like they are there with Lieutenant, participating in these vile acts of sexual assault and corruption. You can hear every door squeak every water droplet and shuffle down the hall, which adds to the tension of this visceral experience. Even though we can tell that the lieutenant's days are numbered within the first 15 minutes of the movie, watching his downward spiral is fascinating because it happens so fast. He alludes to the fact that he's been caught up in the game since he was 14, so he's been in a life of crime for a long time. But this time, he has pushed his luck a bit too far. He relies on his religion to keep him safe, believing he's blessed, even though he shit all over his religion when talking to his colleagues about the nun who was sexually assaulted. The story of this nun's attack by two young men at the church is another thread, along with the baseball game, that ties this movie together and keeps the story moving forward. This nun, Zoe the Junkie, and his dealer's mother are what push Lieutenant to do his final good deed, the only good deed we ever see him do on screen. Right before doing so, we witness the lieutenant snap and go through a bit of a psychotic break when talking to his friend at the club about yet another bet lost. He asks his friend to tell the boogie to double his bet a third time at $120,000. But his friend refuses, giving him the boogie's number, telling him that the boogie won't hesitate to kill him 
him and his whole family. The lieutenant's response is a maniacal laugh that he can't seem to control. After placing his bet with the bookie, in a shaky voice we hadn't heard from the lieutenant before, he takes his drug use up a notch. We started the movie seeing him snort some stuff and thought, oh great, a lousy dad. But then later we see him smoking heroin out of a glass pipe and then we think, oh okay, he's a serious user and a lousy cop. And then at the end of the film, he takes it a step further with shooting the heroin right into his veins. Done in such a small, claustrophobic room. While Harvey used a saline solution, Zoe actually was shooting up, which was her cause of death later in 1999. This is typically the type of scene that would be accompanied by music or funky camera work to better illustrate what Zoe and the lieutenant are feeling, but instead it is accompanied by a monologue delivered by Zoe. She starts this monologue as soon as he starts to trip, likely with the hopes that he would internalize what she is saying and act upon it. I just forget about you tomorrow. But you gotta do it. Her message is clear. For him to be forgiven, he must emulate the nun and even Jesus and commit an act of forgiveness and selflessness, even if that means the end of his life. All this time, he leads us to believe that he thinks that religion is a sham, while at the same time believing it's what's kept him safe in all of his wrongdoings. Maybe now he knows he's pushed God too far and religion can no longer protect him, even if he does resemble a priest from time to time. During his cry out to his vision of Jesus, it's like it all hit him like a ton of bricks. As soon as he utters the words, I'm sorry, a realization comes over him that we've been waiting for this whole time. A sense of guilt and regret for all that he's done. To reach atonement, after his emotional and mental break, he finds the nun's abusers and puts them on a bus with $30,000 of his drug money so they could start a new life instead of him turning them in for the $50,000 reward, which could have helped to settle his debt with the bookie. A decision I find confusing and not exactly noble. Why not give that money to his kids? Those young men have no reason to turn their life around and will likely continue a life of crime. It's interesting that these criminal young men are positioned in pretty much the same way as the lieutenant's sons in the very first scene, sort of bringing things around full circle. A better ending would have been the lieutenant driving the three of them off of a cliff instead of being found dead on the side of the road. Bad Lieutenant earns four and a half rainbow skulls out of five. You can watch this one on Tubi, Amazon, YouTube, Apple TV, Google Play, Voodoo, and Redbox. And thank you again to Terry for your request. If you'd like to submit a movie review request, visit my Patreon page and choose one of the two tiers and register. This will also get you access to my monthly movie nights. Well, thank you again for joining me today, fellow Stardust. I appreciate you being here with me. I'll be back with more videos, so if you haven't already, go ahead and hop on the Rainbow Fright Freight Train and hit that subscribe button along with the notification bell. That way you'll get notified every time I upload a new video. And if you liked this video, please hit the like button and share it with a friend. I hope I see you next time. Peace. <laughs>